world. There was a time when people would cite flying saucers and wherever they made reports they were sometimes treated a ridicule or called wackos or crazy people. What Dr. Heineck and his people are trying to do is present a forum where people can present the most unusual sightings and have them treated with dignity and without fear of being ridiculed. Would you please welcome uh, from the Center for the, uh, the, from the Center of UFO Studies in Evanston, Illinois, Dr. J. Allen Heineck. Dr. Heineck. When you first get a, uh, <clears throat> when you first get a report of a sighting, is your job to assemble evidence that will prove it to be so, or to assemble evidence to prove that it did not happen? You know, there are two ways to go on any investigation. The first thing we do is to try to disprove it, mm -hmm. because what is the point of establishing or of, of perpetuating a myth or something that isn't so? And it turns out that some 90 percent of the raw reports, see, we have a, a nationwide police network, uh, an 800 number that the police use, and uh, we get reports every night from police departments or different parts of the country. Most of them are planets, twinkling stars. Explainable or identifiable explainable. things. The IFOs, we call them, identifiable flying objects. But that remaining 10%, those are the ones we go after. Now, a UFO, the U in UFO, of course, simply means unidentified. It does not necessarily mean visitors from outer space. But it must be unidentified not just to the person who is puzzled by it, but it must remain unidentified after considerable study. Then and only then is it a UFO. What are you investigating right now? What have been some things that have come up in the last couple of months that you're looking into? Well, we have a very interesting case uh, just uh, in, Mis in Muscatine, Iowa, just comes to mind. Uh, sometimes, you know, Animals are the first things to give a uh, warning that some th something strange is oh, going on. Oh, any time. In California, for example, before an earthquake, the animal mm -hmm. kingdom is aware of it long before we are. They do That's true. things. Now, uh, we had a letter from a chap saying that uh, what first called my attention to something going on was the fuss that the horses were raising in the barn. But this time it's rabbits. There is a, it's a rather interesting story. There is a chap that uh, runs a toll gate at Muscatine, Iowa, across the river there. And he runs the, from the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Mostly all night, too. Okay. Yeah. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, it has been his custom for quite a while to feed the, rab the wild rabbits. He takes ra uh, carrots and tosses them out, and the rabbits grab a carrot and dash off. And at this time, at 10 minutes to 3, he goes out there, and the rabbits are just lying flat and immobile on the cement. Just not, absolutely not, not dead. Okay. But just as though they were petrified, paralyzed. And simultaneously, as soon as he sees that, he hears a humming sound, a loud humming sound, and a large yellow object rises from across the river and comes across. And it, the whole thing lasted for some six minutes. As soon as it was gone, the rabbits jumped back to life and scurried off. And also, at the same time, we're still investigating, there was a concomitant power outage in Muscatine. Now, we don't know whether that was, had anything to do with the UFO mm -hmm. or not, but it may have. Usually there is some kind of a, a, a power fluctuation or power So outage. those are the sorts of things that, uh, that we investigate. Mm -hmm. All right. and, uh, but you have no, uh, the jury's still out on this jury's one. The jury's still out on that one, yeah. What do you think the government knows about UFOs that they're not telling us? If you well, could you say see, it in a, sense, in a sentence or two before I introduce uh, Mr. Gersten here. Yeah, he, it's, uh, that's, that's his baby. And uh, the point is that I was with Project Blue Book, of course, for a long while. <clears throat> in fact, it was as an astronomer that I got into this. I think it's always important to... For, for me, it's important to recognize that I am an astronomer and got into it because the Air Force needed an astronomer. And in fact, uh, I continue to be an astronomer. I'm, I'm going to have a, a monthly column in Science Digest on astronomy, not on UFOs. Now, the, in my association with Project Blue Book, I, don't, I know very well that it was not a scientific project. Also, I also know that they never, never would notify the media when an interesting case came up. They did everything they could to keep it down. Keep it keep down. It down. So they definitely withheld information. I will not go so far as to say that it was a, you know, a Machiavellian sinister cover-up. Or, or conspiracy. Kind of conspiracy. Right. I don't like those terms. But, uh, but withholding of documents, yes. And that's exactly what Peter Gersten has been so good at. Getting and so diligent in uh, pursuing it through the Freedom of Information Act. Well, yes. let me do a station break here, and we'll bring uh, Mr. Gersten out, and we'll have a little a little go at this. Good. We will continue with Dr. Heineck, and we'll meet Peter Gersten right after this for our or for the NBC television stations. We'll be right back.
Christian, who is a New York criminal attorney who filed a suit against the U.S. government to force them to release thousands of UFO-related documents. And rather than going through this entire introduction, I'll let Peter tell the story. What kinds of information were you looking for when you applied to the government uh, through the uh, FOI? And what agencies did you have to apply to? Well, basically, um, we were looking for UFO-related information. There's no question about that. And we had to bring lawsuits, unfortunately, against the CIA, the National Security Agency, which is more sec uh, secretive, uh, secretive than, than the CIA. We had to bring lawsuits against the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Federal Aviation Administration for UFO-related documents. What was the motivation for this, Peter? Are you well, a UFO person interested in Well, it in was a hobby, but you have to remember that um, you can request documents of these agencies under the Freedom of Information Act. But unless they release the documents, you're forced to go into court to obtain the documents. And the CIA, for approximately uh, the 30 years the agency was in existence and the UFO phenomena was in existence, and, and interesting enough, they both came into being more or less at the same time, refused to even acknowledge they were studying the phenomena. W were you applying on your own behalf or on behalf of a client? Can I no, on, on behalf of Ground Saucer Watch, which is a UFO organization. Right. And uh, f uh, the following suits were brought on behalf of Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, which is an organization I helped uh, start with a couple of other people. What did you find that you didn't know? That we didn't know? Mm -hmm. Well, at least as far as I was concerned, you can speak to Alan and he will tell you he knew this all along. There's no question about the reality uh, and, the, and the existence of these unconventional aerial objects. You have to remember that during the last three years, the government, and when I say the government, the agencies of this government from the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the National Security Agency, NASA, all the agencies have released approximately 3,000 pages of documents that have been classified up until the present time. Documents that have been filed away in their drawers that, that nobody has ever seen other than military personnel. These documents have now come forward. Uh, besides these documents, the CIA is withholding 57 UFO-related documents in their entirety. The National Security Agency is withholding 135 documents. Do you have a clue to what's on those things they're withholding? No, because the National uh, Security Agency refuses to even tell us the number of documents they have. If it wasn't for the fact that we were in court, and in, a, in, a, in the chambers of the federal judge where the U.S. attorney admitted that it was 135 documents we were talking about. But was Ground Saucer Watch looking for some specific yes, kernel of information? Yes, three documents relating to a Ralph Mayer who took a, a film of a UFO in 1952. And when they put in a request for any documents relating to Ralph Mayer, the CIA admitted that they had five documents but refused to release three documents. Uh, a lawsuit was brought in September of 1977 uh, there were negotiations, conferences with the U.S. attorney who represented the CIA. In September of 1978, uh, the CIA and my client, uh, through the attorneys, entered into a stipulation where the CIA agreed to conduct a reasonable search uh, of all UFO-related documents. In December of 1978, the CIA released 900 pages of UFO-related documents. When in, when in 1976, they told the director of Ground Saucer Watch that they had no interest in UFOs other than the Robertson panel report. So all of a sudden they just found 900 oh, pages of Exactly. And the documents, in the documents themselves, indicate in the same year that they told Spaulding about the, about the lack of interest, they were investigating certain UFO Now, incidents. the word document carries a certain weight to it. When you say document, that could be a lease or title to a house. A document uh, is something as, uh, that's thought of being a heavy piece of paper. A document can also be a very simple piece of paper that contains really non-usable information. So you're using the word 900 documents. 900 pages of documents. Right. I don't know exactly. Well, what, are, what, 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 are, what are these pages document? Um, sightings, but uh, what are referred to in the documents by responsible, reliable persons. You see, all along, before these documents were released, we've been reading civilian reports about individuals who've been seeing flying saucers or UFOs or flying disks, and they ability, their credibility. Now in the documents, these pages that were released by the FBI, the CIA, we see there was no question in the government's mind that these persons were reliable. They're referred to in the documents as early as 1949 as reliable, responsible military officials, generals, Air Force personnel, seeing these unconventional aerial objects. So there's no question. So now we see corroborated evidence that the people that do see these objects, that have been seeing them since 1949, are responsible people, They're not, credible, you know, if they yeah. testified in a court of law. Well, you know, when I first interviewed uh, Alan years ago, there was a theory going around that anybody who saw a flying saucer was probably yeah. befuddled by swamp gas somewhere in Louisiana yeah. and didn't know what he or she was yeah. seeing. We've, we've had a lot of documentation since that I think that that one of the main things that uh, has come out here, that Peter has done, is to substantiate the credibility of many of the civilians because it was easy 
to, and still is, to discredit a civilian. Uh, much more difficult to discredit a military man. Uh, in Blue Book, for instance, we would get reports from military pilots, and that was particularly embarrassing to the Air Force because after they had trained those men, and they couldn't very well, they could say that a civilian pilot might have been un untrustworthy, but they could hardly say that to their, of their own military exactly. pilots, and we got case after case after case from military pilots which never hit the press. Remember about 10 years ago, maybe even longer, there were reports of sightings in the daily press on an almost weekly basis. There'd be an account on page three or four of most major newspapers that somebody somewhere in this country had sighted a flying saucer. Oftentimes there'd be a photograph of the sky with an object. Or you don't see much of that in newspapers anymore. Are there no sightings, or is the press not reporting them? Do they consider it not to be newsworthy? That's, that's it. To a large extent, it's no longer news because the same sorts of things are being reported. See, if it was something new, the, the, this is the one. There are three things about this whole thing, Tom, that no one can deny. They're incontrovertible points. Even the grossest skeptic can't deny them. First of all, is that the UFO reports not only exist, but persist. See, when I started with the Air Force, I thought that this was a fad. In a few years, we just disappeared. Be all over, okay. And it's global. We have reports now from 140 countries. I mean, as many, practically as many countries as there are in the United Nations. And the most important of the three things is that many, unfortunately not all, but many of the reports come from highly, highly credible, technically trained people, you see. What do the Russians say about flying saucers? Do they, do they have anything like this going on? Uh, Alan is the expert in that area. Here we have a report under the, issued under the sponsorship of the... Let me do the commercial and then we'll... The Russians. Uh, we're talking about whether the Russians have a policy on UFOs or flying saucers, as we call them. And well, until very recently, everything you read in Pravda said that uh, flying saucers were propaganda from the decadent Western societies. But recently, the Russian Academy of Sciences has released a report called The Observations of Anomalous Atmospheric Phenomena in the USSR. It doesn't sound like it's UFO, but they say in the introduction, we use the term anomalous atmospheric phenomenon because we consider the previously used term UFO to be less adequate for such work since it contains a definite interpretation of the phenomenon. You see, there's the, there, there, there's the point. The, in the public mind, UFO is synonymous with little green men from outer space. Mm -hmm. uh, that's putting the cart before the horse. What we are studying at the Center for UFO Studies in Evanston is the, are the properties of a phenomenon. Here is this constant flow of reports whose contents are bizarre and tremendously intriguing. That's what we're studying. And the Center is basically a collection of a, a rather loose association of scientists from various universities who have become intrigued by this intellectually challenging thing. In your uh, going through the documentation, were there any stories that you found in there where you could say, this is it? Here, here all the criteria have been met. Here the government is admitting, yes, yeah, somebody saw something and we must admit that it happened. See, the problem is that if you pick out one report, there's always going to be somebody to take that report apart. Uh, there are approximately over the last 10 years, since the beginning of 1970, 1973, at Hunter Airfield in, in Georgia, there was a sighting, an army document. In, in 1975, in Algeria, in March of 75, there was an unusual sighting that the documents reflect. Documents are from all over the world. Uh, in 1975, over, over five SAC those military good, bases, particularly good ones. Uh, there was a, a mini evasion of unidentified objects that, that called for the, the Air Force to implement security option three because one of the UFOs over Loring Air Force Base demonstrated a clear intent in the weapons storage area. See, that's a problem. The government on the one hand says that no UFO studied or investigated has ever been a threat to national security. And here we have in 1975, uh, UFOs um, uh, more or less invading. Uh, in 1976, there was an incident September 19th, 1976 over Iran, which the Defense Intelligence Agency, which uh, got the report from the attaché's office in Iran, evaluated as an outstanding report, a classic report, because, because it contained all the characteristics necessary to evaluate uh, a UFO report. Uh, an F-4 came in contact with a, with a, uh, a UFO, multicolored, brilliant light, and on approaching, an F-4 is an American-made Iranian jet, mm -hmm. on approaching, and we have to realize that this is an American-made jet we're talking about in 1976, on approaching the UFO, which was spotted on both radar and, and visually, uh, it lost all instrumentation and communication systems. So they went out. And then when it decided to leave the area, uh, the instrumentation and communication systems came back on. Another F-4 jet was launched, and as it approached the, U uh, the UFO, 
Um, out of this UFO came another UFO, an unidentified object, one third the size, with, with intense brilliance, and came straight at the F-4. The F-4 uh, tried to fire an AIM-4 missile at, at this UFO. Not and, a smart move, you know. And it's lost not very bright. All, all, once again, all instrumentation, communication, yeah. and now its weapons control panel went out. You know what I think part of the problem with the whole perception business of UFOs is, uh, number one, you said it, we're putting the cart before the horse, but rather than identifying what the objects are, we're, we're trying to guess what's inside the objects. Mm -hmm. The other one is movies, uh, media. The first movie I ever saw that I can remember that related to this was one called The Day the Earth Stood no, Still. A good, one, a good picture, but it was an alien force that caused some harm. Yeah. All the motors and the power stopped. Yeah. And I think we have been so programmed by uh, uh, fantasy motion pictures, television presentations, and in some cases science fiction writing, to think that whatever they are, are against us and we've